we're very familiar with having um, models as in people. Um, and models populate the entirety of the Mao era and after, of course, and they're so important to the way uh, Maoism works and to the way people experienced um, everyday life in Mao's China, being told, well, there are these models who have done this and this, and this is what you can emulate, and this is what the future could look like if we have more of these models and if people um, get inspired by these models. Um, and I was struck by the fact that there um, are objects that can work this way, but also materials. My name is Margot Landman, and I am Deputy Vice President for Programs at the National Committee on US-China Relations. I'm pleased to introduce our speakers for today's interview. Jennifer Altahanger is Associate Professor of Chinese History and Jessica Rawson Fellow in Modern Asian History at the University of Oxford and Merton College. She is joining us from the UK. Denise Ho is Associate Professor of 20th Century Chinese History at Yale University and a fellow in the National Committee's Public Intellectual Program. She is in California. Denise and Jen are the co-editors of Material Contradictions in Mao China, which has Mao's China, which has just been published by the University of Washington Press. In fact, I believe that this is the very first event on the new book. We are delighted by that fact. We're also delighted that Phil Tanari, director of UCCA Center for Contemporary Art, chief executive of UCCA Group, and also a public intellectuals program fellow, is joining us from Beijing and will moderate today's interview. Phil, over to you. Thank you so much. It's uh, such an honor and a pleasure to be here with Jennifer and Denise on the occasion of the publication of this really impressive and fascinating volume, Material Contradictions in Mao's China. And since we don't have so much time, I think we'll we'll, we'll get right into it. Um, I'd like to start by asking Denise just to tell us a bit about the story of this book and how it came together. Um, I think one of, the, one of the really interesting things about it is the way it brings together a group of scholars who share a set of concerns and I know that that's happened over this period. Uh, it's been a special period the last few years um, through, through the pandemic and such. Uh, could you just tell us about, about your editorial journey and about the, the kind of scholarly position that you and this group of, of writers represent? Thank you so much, Phil, for that question and for, for moderating us. I'm really thrilled that we get a chance to introduce the book to the world um, with this panel discussion. Um, so our book started from this common project. We wanted to bring together a network of scholars who are interested in uh, thinking about the Mao years um, through material culture, through objects, materials, and things. And along the way, we organized several workshops and conferences that brought together this network. Uh, Jen also had the opportunity to initiate and direct a teaching website called the Mao Era in Objects. And our goal, as you mentioned, was not just to bring together historians, the two of us teach um, and study modern Chinese history, but to bring together people who were ethnographers, people who were interested in art and architecture, cinema and film, and bring all of these people together to have this conversation. Um, some of the examples, and you'll see this through our in our book's table of contents, um, include things like everyday objects, food and clothing, um, objects related to design, uh, building, production, things like bamboo, bricks, handicrafts, and even cars. Um, we also look at materials that are that are used in art and culture, from film projection uh, materials to uh, dance props. And finally, we're also interested in the circulation and consumption of these objects, um, including things like commodities that you would buy in stores, and also in my work, um, things that might have come in in alternate channels, smuggled goods, uh, things people brought in their luggage, and how, how do these goods find their way into the Chinese market? So we're really interested in casting a broad net and thinking about material culture writ large. The, oh, that's fantastic. And I think it's a good bridge. Um, I, I'd love to ask Jen just a bit about the intended audience for the book, but also um, where it fits in kind of larger trends in in historiography today. I mean, in terms especially of this uh, 
focus on materiality and the idea of looking at, at objects as a way into larger uh, questions. Yeah, thank you for the question, Phil. And uh, thank you also for me for uh, hosting us and um, for giving us this opportunity. I'm absolutely amazed we're all sort of we're spanning half the world at this point in uh, terms of timing. Uh, so this is wonderful that this worked out. Um, so I think at the beginning, when Denise and I were thinking about how to put this project together, one of the things we were most interested in is, um, well, for one, bringing us together as historians and uh, anthropologists and cultural studies scholars and others working on uh, material culture and all its facets, but then also to have this conversation, which all of us independently were having um, with colleagues in those fields who work on other uh, countries and on other cultures um, and on other regions. Um, and we found that when it came to China, very often um, there was great amount of interest in material culture of modern and contemporary China of the Mao period. Um, but very often people didn't feel like they had a, you know, a volume to which they could go and get a first idea of just the diversity of ways of thinking about material culture in Mao's China. Um, now, uh, the other thing that, that came from that is that we realized there's this wonderful research being done by lots of people, and we wanted to give um, a few of us a chance to really show this as an edited volume rather than as monographs, because very often edited volumes can really speak um, for this diversity, can really show something that a monograph and articles on their own cannot. Um, so it was wonderful to do this as a project and as a group. And as Denise said, in the course of those conferences, we really got to know each other and talk across disciplines. And I think and hope that the volume really shows this. Um, and so some of the fields to which we were trying to speak was, of course, uh, global and world history, the history of material culture, um, the anthropology of material culture, because materiality and material culture are such prominent topics for anthropologists and cultural studies scholars, um, and really anyone working on the post-war world, um, where those themes of, you know, what did people actually have, what sort of consumer cultures grew, how did consumption um, and material culture look like in state socialist countries across um, Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union, Asia, and other places. Um, so we were trying to say, you know, here's, here we present here the case of China, um, in an attempt to show how it does and does not at times um, match up. And um, some of the specialties we thought we were seeing, some of the unique points we thought we were seeing in the case of China. And one of them, just to draw this out, is, so as you said, we have material culture, which we take to be objects, and um, really the entirety of how objects are made, what they're made of, how they're used, how, they're, um, uh, how, they, how we see them in everyday life. Um, but then also materiality, which we understood simply to be, you know, the interconnection of objects, people, things, bodies, um, and humans. Um, and that in particular, in uh, the case of uh, state socialism, is a really, really interesting thing that's also theorized at the level actually of uh, theory and uh, ideology. Um, so humans and things really matter, in other words, to Marxist and Maoist thinking. Right. This, uh, there's this line in the introduction that while the average Chinese person may not have described their environment in materialist terms, these ideas were foundational to the political, social, economic, cultural world that they lived in. And I think that's something that really comes through um, in each of the perspectives offered. I wanted to turn for, to a second, uh, for a second to this question of, or this framework of contradictions, uh, which, which appears in the title and is, of course, a word that you know, anyone who's familiar with Mao's China knows from, from the famous essay on contradictions. Um, there's another line in, in the introduction that talks about, um, uh, excuse me, about um, tensions between materials and makers, people and objects, abundance and scarcity, ideology and practice. Um, but I, I guess for the both of you, or maybe for Denise first, how did this framework of, of contradictions emerge as the way to, to, to draw all these perspectives together and, and, and why is it uh, so convincing? Thanks for asking that question, Phil. So uh, we when we started out, uh, the first conference was called Material Culture, not Material Contradictions. And it actually came out through the presentation and discussion of uh, the contributors' papers. 
um, that we came up with the idea of contradictions. Uh, as you mentioned, um, there are some contradictions and some tensions that uh, that came out that uh, we think about when we think about China uh, in this period, uh, the difference between uh, city and countryside, uh, between plenty and scarcity, between desire and reality. And there are also a number of contradictions that came out that uh, wouldn't be as immediately obvious. That is between China's past and its present, between the present and the future, uh, between China and the world. Uh, and so we were as a group collectively struck by the number of contradictions that came out through the study of material culture. Uh, so I think in terms of the word contradiction, we mean it in two ways. The first is to think about historical contradictions, that is, the actual tensions that existed in that period. And then the second is, as you say, uh, to think about uh, contradictions as uh, something that's productive, a dialectic, that when you think about uh, tensions between, say, uh, desire and reality, it teaches us something new about uh, the Mao era and about the Chinese experience. So in the second sense, contradictions is an analytical category, something that produces something else. That's lovely. Um, and it brings brings us to 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 Jen, and I wanted to to talk. Uh, so 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 Jen's chapter is called. Um, bamboo objects and socialist construction. And she looks at how, at bamboo as what she calls a hinge material, what you call a hinge material um, that, that connects past, present, and future. But um, there's this a lovely moment in your in your chapter where you talk about how the, the stories about these uh, key bamboo crafts experts that you, that you, that you research um, are able to narrativize how Chinese socialism facilitated novel modes of production that maximized the abilities of people and materials, fostered skills, and created as well as disseminated technical and design knowledge. Um, that's a, that's an awful lot to to for a piece of bamboo or a, a set of practices around bamboo to be able to do. And I think it's a illustrative of 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 what most or all of the scholars in in the book do, uh, and that's to draw. Uh, larger truths from from a specific um, object or 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 set of practices. Um, I I'd love to just hear a bit about how um, I, I know how you came to that topic and and what and you know what's what specifically um, uh, it, it it can tell us about the period. Yeah, thank you for that question, Phil. Um, as we come to topics, it's always uh, I think it's always a curious road and when you trace it later on you're wondering how exactly did I come up with this and um but in my case I think it's uh well it's connected to a larger book project I'm currently working on a book about uh furnishing socialist China the history of furniture and furnishings um and I start with materials and the obvious one of course is wood um but then bamboo is the other very prominent material in uh my documents and in the stories I trace and something that struck me is that we're very familiar with having um, models as in people. Um, and models populate the entirety of the Mao era and after, of course, and they're so important to the way uh, Maoism works and to the way people experienced um, everyday life in Mao's China, being told, well, there are these models who have done this and this, and this is what you can emulate, and this is what the future could look like if we have more of these models and if people um, get inspired by these models. Um, and I was struck by the fact that there um, are objects that can work this way, but also materials. Um, so if you think about steel, for instance, steel very much is a material that has become associated um, in, in very different ways. Um, so not obviously not just positive um, ways with uh, the, the way in which the Mao era is narrated and with the way in which the Mao era was experienced. Um, but then there are also other materials and bamboo was one of them. And what struck me is that when you look at sort of the aspect of um, furnishings, there is plastic, there's bamboo, there's wood, and they all tell slightly different stories. And so I thought, well, let's take a look at bamboo since bamboo is such a, um, a material classically associated with uh, China. Um, and as I started looking into this, there were all these stories about bamboo craftsmen and what they could do, essentially what they could do to unlock a material's potential. Um, and then within these stories, there were these contradictions. I tell the story of one bamboo craftsman who, um, on the one hand, manages 
to you know, persevere through the difficult times of the first half of the 20th century and then essentially is liberated in his craft after 1949. Um, and he becomes a model laborer for being able to, you know, have bamboo, cheap bamboo behave the way that really expensive bamboo would behave or really expensive wood would. Um, essentially making, unlocking the potential of everybody having a kind of furniture that was previously reserved for the rich. Um, and at the same time, there's this inherent contradiction that actually that sort of work in reality brought um, this bamboo craftsman uh, Zhang out of the countryside. So there's this push and pull between rural and urban, between what bamboo can and cannot do, and between the fact that bamboo constantly for people in everyday life is a material they tend to have to fall back uh, to when they are experiencing hardship um, and when there's very little other otherwise in terms of materials. So thinking about how that actually that push and pull works was what fascinated me. Exactly what you talk about as the, the, I mean, if we want to go back to contradictions, one was, you note that handicraft proved difficult to mechanize. And the other was that people continued to associate bamboo with, with scarcity rather than abundance. Um, and one thing that I think is really remarkable about this volume is the way that the chapters uh, build on each other. And I think there's sort of a narrative going on just in the, in the way one moves through the book. So at the risk of, you know, a sort of some kind of a spoiler. Uh, we we go from your chapter on bamboo and socialist construction to this really wonderful chapter by Cole Raskin about bricks. And you you just mentioned steel and bricks are kind of the anti-steel because they can be made um, through a set of fairly typical um, practices in different places, but and they and they have this sort of proletarian character to them, but they they also end up functioning as something of a, a palimpsest, I guess, and and taking on different properties at different times. Then we go into Christine Ho's chapter about design and handicraft, which really talks about how um, design knowledge was sort of formalized, as, as particularly through the foundation of a, of a university, a, so the Central Academy of, of Arts and, and Crafts, uh, to teach that. And then into Emily Wilcox's chapter about dance props in the rural imaginary, which really I think does this. It's it's quite poetic. I mean, it involves uh, her own experiences as a dancer, but I, there's there's these great kind of anecdotal moments that really draw out um, larger truths. I mean, I, I think about when she talks about being in a rehearsal and the, the dancers unable to conceive of performing without their props, uh, and then uh, on to all kinds of ideas about these props as mediums kind of connecting these urban dancers with the rural scenes they're supposed to be enacting. And then uh, oh, and then we get to this the chapter about mobile projection units, which I'm sure we'll come back to, but, and then we get to Denise's chapter, um, which is, I think, really remarkable because it's it's the one that's explicitly transnational in a way, right? And, and Denise is talking about uh, packages that were mailed from a family elsewhere in the in the Chinese diaspora to uh, their relatives inside of China during various difficult moments, um, and it comes down to all kinds of really specific things about how the postal service worked and, and taxation and duties. And then finally to sort of what these objects meant to the people who received them and how they uh, were sometimes even too, I don't know, reverential to, to, to use them. And so what kind of roles they performed. So I'd love to hear um, from Denise about, yeah, about, about, about your essay and, and where that came from and um, and maybe where it fits into your larger body of scholarship as well would be interesting. Thank you so much. So it's it's part of a, a larger book that I'm working on now called Cross Border Relations: A Grassroots History of Hong Kong and China. Um, and it, I think the the research itself comes out of a number of uh, of different um, starting points. But one of the starting points is actually uh, something my students used to ask me about teaching um, when I would teach lectures on the Great Leap Forward. And the question was, did people outside of China know? And the example that I would give was this mailing of packages from the diaspora. And in my uh, in my essay, I concentrate on Hong Kong. So people, uh, Chinese people living outside of China, mailing packages into China. And one of the uh, one of the things to know is that after 1949, there was no more parcel post service. You couldn't mail big packages into China anymore. Instead, uh, there was this uh, system devised, actually a number of different systems of two pound packages. So as a resident of Hong Kong, um, you could put together a, a care package of two pounds and they were primarily filled with things like food and medicine. 
and you could have it delivered to your relatives um, in mainland China. Uh, one of the things we think about with material culture studies is what do things teach us that words cannot? And one of the really interesting things about this phenomenon of the two pound small packages was that you weren't allowed to include a letter. You could include an inventory saying, oh, this has you know, a bag of sugar or a can of fish, uh, but you couldn't actually express words. So here we have a way uh, of thinking about Chinese history during this period, and I'm looking at the late 50s, early 1960s, the time when uh, China is experiencing a serious privation and in some places famine. How were people in the diaspora able to communicate with things, with their relatives and friends in the mainland? Um, and I think along the way, you have the circulation of goods from outside of China appearing in uh, not only uh, Chinese families, but also Chinese markets, because overseas Chinese had an extra quota, and so people brought in extra things that would work their way into the Chinese economy. Uh, so the story I'm interested in telling here is where did these outside things come from? How do they appear in the Chinese landscape of material things? Um, and then what do they mean to people? I think for the ordinary person, this meant a connection to family uh, outside. It meant a critical lifeline of food um, and medicine uh, during a period of privation. It could also be politically, uh, there, there could be a political context or valence behind it because you were seen as having overseas connections. Um, and so ultimately I'm interested in the kinds of stories, the, the propaganda that came from this material outside. And how did it uh, maybe speak back to official propaganda during that period? It, it's, yeah, I think it really brings home how these objects can speak with all kinds of ambiguities embedded and um, and on different registers, sort of at the same time. And then, and then it's interesting because we go from there into Laurence Coderre's uh, essay, which is about which is about plenty, right? Which is about representations of excess or of of uh, of the plentiful in, and that's a, an interesting one to me too because it's 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 the one that doesn't actually focus on objects per se, but on representations of objects in in the media, um, and then onward to Madeline Yue Dong's piece about about food and restaurants and kind of where the agricultural meets the urban through places like Dong Lai Shun or Liu Biju. Um, and then and then and then we go actually into the countryside with Jakob Eifert's piece about the discrepancies between rural and urban standards of living. And that was a really, I think, revelatory one for me and I'm sure for a lot of readers, just because it, it, in a way it is easy when you're writing about material culture to focus on the on the urban, and um, I guess it's important to remember that there were there there was not one material culture of of Mao's China. There were actually at least two, and probably and actually many many more. Um, I, I guess I, for both of you, how that kind of diversity of material cultures came out in the conversations that led to this book, and how you see it as the editors uh, in in the submissions and chapters that you ultimately shaped. I can take a first uh, first answer at that. Thank you for bringing up this question of diversity because um, I I was thinking about this as well in terms of the main takeaways of the book that um, I learned so much about different parts of China and especially um, about uh, things that are the, the countryside, which is not something I've historically focused on. Um, I mean, the level of scarcity uh, that's evident in uh, Jakob's study of of cotton in the rural countryside, uh, the fact that an ordinary person's uh, ration wasn't enough even to make a suit of clothing, um, the existence of so little oil that you would use an oil dropper to just add a little bit of oil onto boiled vegetables, um, it really hit home to me how little I know about so many other places in China. Uh, I think that we have this, um, diverse experience that comes out not only in that chapter, but let's say the chapter about the third front. How do we have this exist this creation of um, a, a unit um, in the rural countryside that has aspects of the urban and aspects of the rural? And how do these people travel between um, the, the urban and the rural in the process of participating in a third front project? Um, so I, I think that it really hit home to me um, many aspects of China's diversity in this period. 
And I also wanted to bring out um, the aspect of the political campaign. Um, so what I think that this volume does is it brings out how ordinary people um, experienced campaigns through material culture. Uh, the example of the Beijing food production um, is, is, is a good one here in Madeleine Dong's contribution. Um, and in this case, the campaign is the socialist transformation. So the nationalization of, of businesses uh, like a pickle company um, or a hot pot restaurant. How did economic policies, let's say different incentives for um, producing vegetables or different incentives for working at a restaurant or working at a, at a pickle company, how did these transform the taste of food? Um, by making certain vegetables much more plentiful or other vegetables scarce? Uh, how did the incentives of, um, of work, for example, apprentices didn't want to learn to be expert makers or because there was no incentive to do so, or there was no incentive to stir um, uh, ingredients around the clock anymore. How did this really change the taste of food for ordinary people? Um, and so just to step back again, uh, I think one way we can understand how ordinary people in the Mao period experienced life uh, through political campaigns is to look at their material lives. I think the dimension I would add to the two that Denise just gave is also the fact um, that all of the chapters, I think, really speak to the experience of making and making do and just how closely the two were actually connected throughout. So I think, for instance, Jakob Eifert's chapter makes very clear that, you know, so he talks about the fact that the countryside is better understood in terms of non-commodities um, and things. Um, and he takes us away from a focus that many post-war histories globally have on consumer culture and what you can buy and what you can purchase and what gets made and what the circulation, um, the circuits are of these products. And he says, well, actually, we need to take a step back because, first of all, most people in the countryside couldn't actually purchase things and didn't purchase things. Um, and secondly, um, when we look at when we move away from looking at just what you can get or cannot get that's readily made, you start looking at what people actually do and what they do with things and how they transform things and how they make a lot out of maybe little, very, very often in the countryside, little, and then in the cities, um, what they make out of things just because what they might want to buy is just not available. Um, and if you look at all the chapters, there's making in every single one of them. Um, and so I think that really is a nice thread throughout uh, that, you know, shows us actually how people thought about what do we have and what can we change and how, in other words, can we actually transform our own lives? I think um, I, to jump off of that, another way to think about making is to think about agency, right? So we often looking at China from the outside, we wonder about the agency of the ordinary person. Uh, and I think the study of material culture also shows how people had agency, whether it's making do with ordinary things, um, as Jen uh, mentioned, or um, uh, in, in, my, in my example, how ordinary people were able to receive things from outside and then use them. Um, one other example that I love from Jaylee's chapter mm -hmm. on the film projectionists is how uh, these film projectionists, so these are um, people who would carry film projection materials from the scrolls to the electricity generators um, to the countryside and then show them in the open air, how uh, they were also able to interpret and, and have a kind of agency in showing the films because they weren't just uh, projecting the films, they were also performing, they were speaking, um, they were incorporating music, they were using bamboo clappers. Um, and one, uh, one moment that I love in that piece is uh, the moment of projecting a film, uh, and it's a foreign film, and there's some intimate scenes that normally somebody wouldn't uh, show in China. Um, but the film projectionist does the right thing, she covers the, uh, the, the lens, but then the fingers open a crack so that people actually do have access to that foreign film, um, but she's also done her job. Uh, so to me, that was a wonderful moment to show how uh, this use of material culture allowed people to have access to, uh, to, to broader culture, uh, and here to the visual culture of cinema uh, and, and, and media. Yeah, and the other examples, if you think about it, there's also Emily's uh, chapter where she shows that uh, dancers are making their own props and there are these guidelines. And I think guidebooks turn up quite a bit throughout um, explaining to people how you actually make your own things, how you 
go about. It's essentially a DIY guide um, to your own props, to working with bamboo, to making bricks. And so these DIY guides keep popping up throughout the chapters. And I think it's an it's, it's, it's a really nice indicator for you know the way knowledge was meant to be spread so that people would be actually able and empowered to make these things themselves. Great. Um, and when we get to the very end of the book, the, the afterword, which is written by Jonathan Bach, uh, talks about talks about the uncanny, right? And it's kind of this wonderful way to, to end this whole series of meditations, just um, going into sort of psychological terrain to think about what these mean. Um, I was curious as editors, where that leaves us or where that leaves you at the end of this journey. And, and uh, if, if that's a, a good place to set that. Sorry, that, I didn't really put that very well. Um, <laughs> maybe you could just tell us a little bit about how the book ends with this this kind of investigation of the psychological and talking about uh, materiality and the uncanny. Yeah, so I think we were both excited that uh, Jonathan Bach agreed to uh, write the afterword um, because, of course, Jonathan has worked on, uh, he, well, he's worked on East Germany and he's worked on China. And so he's one of those rare, wonderful <laughs> scholars who really works across uh, different countries that um, have very different, but then also comparable experiences. Um, and um, so his reading of the chapters, he, so he took, oh, no, I'm getting a bit hung up. Um, he took, uh, well, he he said he could take a more theoretical approach and actually think through how um, all of the examples really draw out uh, specific points about that ideological world of Marxism and Maoism at the time, but then also how that relates to other theoretical questions that scholars have asked about materiality and material culture. Um, and this is where the uncanny came in. Um, and in terms of, you know, where, where does this leave us at the end of the volume? Um, well, I think this brings us back to something we were talking about at the beginning. It leaves us First of all, with a much more complex picture of material culture, materiality than I think we had um, in earlier years, um, hopefully a contribution that really um, shows just how many facets of material culture there were in the Mao period, often the period thought of as having little material culture to speak of. Um, and I think one of the points the introduction makes is that just because you don't have a lot of things doesn't mean there's not a lot of material culture. Um, and also it helps us to think about, you know, where, where do we really go from here um, in the post-78 uh, period in the reform era? You know, what actually happens when we suddenly have an explosion of material culture for many people? Um, and how do um, how do these three decades um, since the 1950s, how are they remembered? How are they understood? Is there a nostalgia for certain items? Is there not? Um, and how do actually things play a role in how the Mao era is remembered? I think that's a wonderful place to leave us, uh, reminding us, uh, as you as you both said so eloquently at the beginning, how people attributed great meaning to materials and objects precisely because they were rare and difficult to obtain. And I think through this book, we all uh, come to just a much, a much more interesting, nuanced, um, gritty, uh, particular understanding of of what daily life might have been like and how that related to the way people understood themselves and their place in this society in this historical moment. So thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking with both of you. And um, I hope lots of people are able to, to read and learn from this book. Thank you so much, Phil. And thank you to the National Committee. Thank all three of you. Um, as Phil just said, I really hope this whets the appetite of the viewer and listener to this conversation. It's a fascinating book. I'd also like to thank the National Committee staff members behind the scenes who've made today's interview possible. We hope those who have tuned in found the interview interesting and informative and that you will join us for future National Committee programming. Thanks again and goodbye. <laughs>